Thank you, David, and good morning, everyone. Shall we uh, start with a, a word of prayer? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness. Uh, we thank you for your outpouring of amazing love and grace that uh, even for us now is, is, is hard to fully comprehend uh, the depths of love that you have for us and the way that you've showed that uh, in all the things that you do for us. And we uh, pray on this day as we reflect on some of those things that you may be glorified. In your name, Lord. Amen. So as I look up, I just realized the church clock here at All Saints is saying nearly 10 o'clock. So that rec I reckon that means I've probably got about an hour and 20 minutes to, uh, to, to speak this morning. But uh, only joking, I'm going to be a good boy and I won't speak more than an hour, definitely. Um, so, uh, yeah, as part of uh, the, the preparation uh, for this morning, um, I kind of did what I often do when uh, I get the, the privilege of, uh, of speaking. And that is to pray a lot. Uh, to, uh, to read a lot and to research and to, to pray some more. Uh, but on, in, on this occasion, I got the sense um, that it might be worth um, looking at perhaps or listening to uh, some sermons preached on this day in the past. So I did what most of us would do and uh, opened my computer and typed in uh, Palm Sunday Sermons. And I was inundated, as you can imagine, with lots and lots of choice, uh, lots and lots of pages full uh, of options to choose and as I sort of flicked through the first few uh, there was one name uh, that, that came into my mind uh, or at least uh, I recognized um, it was a name of uh, a, a guy who we've used in our youth ministry many many years ago uh, we invested in a series called uh, made to make a difference and uh, it's a chap called Max Licardo who some of you may have heard of and, and maybe read some of his, his books it was a mission-based series it was encouraging uh, our young people uh, to live out the faith right now. And it included testimonies uh, from many young people who were doing just that in their local communities, as well as uh, some testimonies from those who traveled overseas uh, and uh, sought out those perhaps most in need, uh, a bit like uh, Sadiq and, uh, and Jordan did uh, a few years ago with Sam when they went to uh, South Africa. And as he started in his introduction, uh, Max shared uh, his passion for the game of golf. In fact, he used the word that often we, we misuse sometimes uh, by saying he loved golf and loved to watch uh, golf. I think he probably meant he really liked it and he enjoys uh, watching golf. And in particular, he, he sort of mentioned one tournament uh, that takes place in, in Augusta, Georgia each year. And it's one of uh, the major golfing events of the calendar. Uh, it is, of course, the Masters. And I think I'm right in saying that um, the top 50 golfers of the, at the time are automatically invited, along with all the former champions who've won the event previously. So it kind of guarantees a strong field, strong competitive field. And often some of the best golf of the year is played uh, in, that, in that tournament. And it kind of reminded me of something I'd read a few years before that uh, by another chap we've used in our youth ministry, called David Nasser in his book, Glory Revealed. He was coming at it from a totally different angle. He didn't have a particular passion for golf. In fact, he didn't really get why there was so much commotion about this one tournament. Um, he was aware that it was very difficult to get hold of a ticket. In fact, tickets uh, were so precious that some people would often leave them in their will to be passed down to their children. I jokingly said at the nine o'clock service, just like Manchester United season tickets, because as, as you know um, from hearing him in the past, our, our vicar, our dear vicar Anthony, is, a, is an avid Manchester United supporter. Um, of course, David could um, appreciate uh, that the course that the golf tournament was played on was well kept and maintained. Uh, the greens are perfectly manicured. The... Uh, Many of the holes are, are surrounded by serene waters and there's these majestic and huge oak trees that feature uh, on the fairways of many of the holes as an example of God's creation. But he didn't really get what the tournament was all about. And unexpectedly one year he was invited to go and actually attend in person. And he didn't want to be ungracious so he accepted the invitation and went along 
not really up with any great expectations. He was aware of the traditions of the tournament, the fact that the winner not only presumably gets a huge amount of money, but also uh, gets the green jacket, presented usually by the previous year's winner. And if you do win the tournament the following year, you get to choose the menu at the inaugural ball that launches um, the week of the Masters. It attracts thousands and thousands of people when we're not in COVID-restricted times. And millions more watch it on television. I myself have watched it a few times and got a little bit of an appreciation for some of the things that he was talking about in his book. When he went, and I suppose like for anybody who goes to an event like that, he kind of thought he's got two ways of watching. One was to pick up a spot and stay there pretty much all day and see all the field, the golfers uh, that were taking part, pass by one by one. Or he could follow a favourite golfer around and see them navigate all 18 holes. Because he wasn't particularly into golf and he didn't have a favourite golfer, he chose the first option, just simply to find a spot to, uh, to sit or stand and watch the day unfold before his eyes. He tried to find a spot that wouldn't be overcrowded and it wouldn't be surrounded constantly by lots of fans shouting and screaming, as often is the case at these uh, type of events. And the day unfolded much as he expected, uh, until a point came when suddenly there seemed to be swarms of people. I think he described them as swarms of bees, although in biblical terms we might say swarms of locusts, um, gathered around uh, this, this hole, uh, more so than at any other point in the day. And that was because the world's best golfer was about to play the hole, and at that time it was Tiger Woods. This was when Tiger was in the prime of his powers. Uh, he seemed to be winning pretty much everything around. He was the world's number one and he attracted the, the biggest crowds to watch him. He hit the first shot and by chance it landed not too far away from where David was stood. So pretty soon those swarms of people were around him uh, and he felt a little bit claustrophobic. But as Tiger came to address the ball and then start to swing... He could almost sense the power transferring from uh, the golfer to the club. And once again, Tiger hit a near-perfect shot very close to the pin on the green, presenting him with another birdie opportunity in a round that saw him win the Masters yet again. It was at that point that David sort of realised and got what the Masters was all about, it wasn't about the condition of the course. It wasn't about the tradition or even the hospitality he'd received whilst he was there. It was about seeing the master swing the, the club and win the tournament. And it kind of put a little bit into perspective for me um, what it might have been like to be witness to Jesus' ministry. Because wherever he went, and as we read through the four Gospels, whatever part we choose, we see large crowds gathering and we get a sense of the frenzy and electricity that must have come with the times that Jesus ministered, the things that he said, the things that he did. One example um, which uh, Anthony mentioned in his nine o'clock sermon last week was the healing of the paralytic man. We can remember from Luke's gospel that there were a group of friends who were determined to get this man in front of the master. No doubt they were confident that he could heal this man's physical paralysis. But there was a problem, and that was simply the crowds were so big. To get to the room that Jesus was in was no mean feat. In fact, they didn't see him away through. The crowds were that dense. They were literally turning up from all over Galilee, Judea and Jerusalem. Word had spread. And we've got to remember in these days, this is long before some of the modern technologies that we have available to us today. As you know, I'm not a fan of social media, but it does allow us to communicate effectively and quickly, if done correctly. It was long before anybody had the idea of the internet or television or newspapers or radio. It was literally word of mouth that spread from people who were giving honest and accurate accounts 
of what they'd seen, what they'd witnessed, and what they'd heard. And no doubt when these crowds gathered, there would be some people who were coming purely out of curiosity. Or maybe as you would go to see a, a show, to see some sort of spectacle. But the vast majority were coming because they dared to hope that this Jesus was the one promised by God in Scripture. And many came in the need, like this paralytic man, of a healing touch, which reminds us of a song we often sing, just one touch from the king changes everything. And that's what these guys were after for their friend. They wanted him to avoid a life full of begging. They wanted him to be restored and renewed back to as he should be. So despite the challenges of this large gathering, despite the fact there was no obvious path through to get him into the house where Jesus was, they found a way. They managed somehow to get onto the roof and lower their friend down. I have no idea how they managed to do that. I know buildings in those days were different to, to what they are today and roofs were typically flat. But nonetheless, it wasn't an insignificant achievement to get their friend lowered to be at the feet of the master. And they weren't left disappointed. Jesus did exactly what they'd hoped he would do. He healed their friend, healed him of his physical paralysis. But he did far more than that. And he gave us a, another insight into who he really is and what his re mission was all about. Because he also forgave their sins. And in doing so, dealt with something far more important, their eternal spiritual paralysis. And it shows us a little bit about what Jesus' mission is all about. And we read more through scripture, through the gospels, and we see time and time again, not just Jesus meeting physical and material needs, but also, and more importantly, meeting spiritual needs. He's met our spiritual needs too, even all these years beyond these times. If we were to flick through a little bit further through Luke's gospel, we'd come across um, a miraculous event that helps us quantify perhaps just the size of these gatherings that were taking place when Jesus was around. So, for example, if we go to the feeding of the 5,000, which is a, a sign that appears in all four Gospels, so we know this is a very significant event indeed, we get a picture for how many people may well have been there. We know from reading the 5,000 related only to the men that were present that day in this vast expanse of open land. But we also know women and children were present too. So most commentators would suggest we should at least double or even treble that figure to get a better idea of the crowd that was gathered that day. And it was yet another uh, miraculous event that is the backdrop to the events of today that we're focusing on here this morning. If we were to go to John's Gospel and just go to the chapter before the one that Marjorie read uh, for us, then we would see the account of the death and the raising of Lazarus. Lazarus and his two sisters, Martha and Mary, were both known to Jesus. They were friends. So it's understandable and natural that when Lazarus became ill, the first thought was to call for Jesus. No doubt they had seen at first hand the powers he has over sickness. And perhaps the fact that they call for him straight away suggests to us that they were worried that the illness that their brother had was serious. The first time we read this account, we might be slightly taken aback by Jesus' initial reaction. Rather than return to Bethany straight away, he stays where he is for a further two more days. We later realize that by the time they set off, Lazarus has already died, as he shares with his disciples that their friend has fallen asleep. And we know today that's a New Testament euphemism for death. So by the time they eventually return back to Bethany, Lazarus is dead and has been in his tomb for four days. 
And as is the custom and the tradition, uh, many were coming to pay their respects. This would go on typically for at least a week. And because Bethany was so closely located to Jerusalem, then many officials from the temple would also come and offer their respects as well. Both Mar Martha and Mary knew Jesus could have healed their brother had he been there in time. But what they were about to see is Jesus also had the power over death. Not just in the last day, but in their day, right before their eyes. As the miracle is about to happen, the master asks someone to take away the stone, demonstrating that human obedience often has a place to play, as a part to play in supernatural work. Jesus assures Martha that everything will happen just as he has promised and the way that God intended. All will see the glory of God this day. Martha's role, and ours too today, is simply to trust him. The praying aloud that we read about in this account is for the benefit of the Jews who had gathered and who were watching. Because Jesus wanted everyone to be clear, she want, he wanted everyone to know that the resurrection of Lazarus would clearly be the result of the cooperation between God, the Father in heaven, and God, the Son on earth. He was well aware that this miracle would further incite the authorities and would ultimately lead to his persecution and cruci crucifixion. And we see this as we read that account in the, next, in, the, in the final few verses of that chapter. We can note that the high priest of that year, Caiaphas, advised the religious leaders to have the Romans kill Jesus instead of wiping out all the Jews. And in doing so, Caiaphas unknowingly prophesied that Jesus would die in the place of all sinners. One of the most important and biblical holy days is the 10th day of the Hebrew month of Nisan. Passover fell on the 15th day of that month, but the 10th day was the day the lamb was chosen and taken to the house that would, on Passover, offer it up. So the 10th day of Nis Nisan is also known as the day of the lamb. The day it is chosen, the day it is taken, and, and, and identified with the house that would sacrifice it. The tenth day of this Hebrew month of Nisan is also known to us as this day, Palm Sunday. The day the lamb was led on a donkey or a colt, depending on what version of the Bible you read, into the streets of Jerusalem. And there he was greeted, as was normally the case, with lots and lots of people, but this time he was greeted with cheers and celebration fit for a king, with, as David reminded us earlier, cloaks and palm branches laid at his feet. In riding this um, young colt that no one else had ever ridden, then he was fulfilling the prophecy that we find in Zach Zachariah that was prophesied hundreds of years before this event took place. It was no accidental or fortuitous happening. He knew beforehand what he would do and how he would do it. It underscores his control over these events. And a cult that no one has ridden was certainly suitable for a king. He chose to come as a humble king, not choosing something like a, a great big stallion to ride on. He was returning to the place of his father's dwelling. As the Passover lambs were led to their homes, the lamb was being led from the Mount of Olives into the city gates. God brought the Lamb of God to the house of God, Jerusalem. The lambs brought home on this day had to be sacrificed on Passover by those who dwelt in the house. And so too, the Lamb of God would be sacrificed on Passover by those who dwelt in Jerusalem. 
And this had to happen so that the blessings of salvation can come. And so for us today, we must also bring the lamb, him, into the place of our lives, into every room and every aspect and every part, because blessings can only begin when the lamb comes home. If we move to the reading, our second reading that Marjorie brought us, and to the Psalms, we're taken to this special place where Christ joins his voice with ours, and we with his. It is true The world we live in today isn't as it was meant to be. And at times it can seem very dark indeed. The Psalms show us, though, that there is hope because there is a light that shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. It is true this is a psalm of lament and the nature of the psalmist's distress is is described in broad terms of physical illness, isolation, mental anguish, and persecution. However, it moves from lament to trust, and then back to lament and to trust again. There's a cyclical aspect to it, and a sense that you get that the psalmist is at uh, at his wit's end. He's been pushed to the very limits of what he can bear. But the story doesn't end there, and our story doesn't end there either, because he knows the one who has power and will to deliver him from his suffering. So he places his trust in God and his goodness. The psalmist's complaint coincides well with the description of the suffering servant we see in Isaiah. So let me just share with you uh, a few verses from from that great book, Isaiah. And in particular, I'm going to turn to chapter 50. And I'm going to read from from verse 4 of that chapter through to the end. The Lord has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I will not and I was not rebellious, I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting, but the Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced, therefore I have not set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. He will be my adversary. Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Behold, all of you, who kindle a fire, who equip yourselves with burning torches. Walk by by the light of your fire and by the torches that you have kindled. This you have from my hand and you shall lie down in torment. And in the sort of commentary in my Bible that comes or the summary commentary that comes with that, uh, this is what it says. In this third servant song, the Lord's special servant affirms his faith in the Lord. He has carried out the Lord's commission in the face of ridicule and opposition, confident that the Lord will sustain and vindicate him. The song gives insight into the suffering servant's commitment to carry out God's will. We're therefore encouraged to read this psalm as a reflection of Christ's own suffering. And the words we hear Jesus utter in the moments before his death Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, echoes the psalmist's words from verse 5 of Psalm 31. It shows us clearly that the teaching that sometimes we might hear in some places, not in here thankfully, but in some places, uh, there's a teaching that goes along the lines of God's presence is associated with material blessing 
and God's absence is associated with suffering and hardship. This is yet another example of false teaching that scripture warns us about, very much like the prosperity gospel that seems to have emerged in America and been exported to other parts. It reminds us of the importance of reading and knowing our scriptures so that we may detect those who teach falsely. The truth is, as seen through this psalm, where there is hardship, where there is pain, and where there is suffering, that is where Jesus is. And that is also where we need to be too. We can take encouragement from many of the different forms of ministry that take place from this church. And I'm going to name just three examples, so don't please feel slighted if I've not used you as, your, as, as one of the examples, because there were literally too many to consider. But um, when Gwen and others go to places like Comfort Zone to offer uh, food to those who are hungry, then that matters. When Hazel, who's also here in church this morning, uh, takes trips to Calais with clothing and blankets to those in need, the refugees, then that matters. When people like Margaret, who perhaps is tuning in uh, this morning, uh, when she is able to, and hold coffee mornings to raise awareness and funds for the leprosy mission, that matters. We were and we are made to make a difference. But what sets us apart from just pure charity, because each of those um, examples of ministry do offer some um, physical or uh, material help, what sets us apart is we can also, um, like Jesus, offer hope, offer love, and deal with um, sp uh, spiritual needs as well as we bring the gospel message alongside these good deeds uh, to those who are in need. Because their greatest need, even though they may not necessarily always recognize it, is the need to be reconciled with the Father. Because sin today, as it was in Jesus' day, is still a problem. We gathered here this morning at All Saints Church, and I would imagine the vast majority who are viewing, um, have benefited from what Jesus has done. We've already received our salvation. But there are many more in the streets and the neighborhoods and the communities around us who are still living in ignorance and darkness. And as Jesus asks for the stone to be removed, it reminds us that there might be stones of ignorance that we may need to remove when we bring this message of truth, of hope, and of love to those who are very much in need. The truth is, Jesus took upon himself the sins of the entire world, including our sins. He suffered excruciating pain, the most painful death ever in our history. These things are facts. He journeyed to a darker place than we will have to go and was temporarily separated from the Father for the only time in eternity. He did this so redemption could come, so that we, with, repent with repentance in our hearts, can go to the foot of the cross and know that whatever we've done we can be forgiven and more than that Jesus through his spirit will help us turn around do the 180 and change because it's his desire that we are reconciled with the father of all so on this day like on the original day uh, that we're looking back on we can join the crowds that gathered and offer our praise and worship to the one who reconciles us, the one who brings us redemption, the one who opened the doors of salvation. And so we can go back to the Psalms, and this time I've chosen Psalm 118 as an example of the praise that we may offer. And I'm reading just two verses 
uh, starting at verse 25 of this psalm. It says this, Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. And that first verse I read, verse 25, which says, Save us, we pray, O Lord, is pronounced Hosanna. It is, of course, far more than a simple expression of praise. But we add our praise to those who praised the Lord in their day, on this day. So at the start of this holy week, our journey begins again. Back to the room above, where that was the massive outpouring of love as Jesus washed the disciples' feet. To the garden and the quiet before the storm. To the arrest, the mockery, the torture, the punishment, and ultimately the journey to the cross. And as we look forward to next Sunday, we'll be celebrating again because our Lord lives. He was resurrected. He is alive and he is at work in this world today, even though it might seem a hopeless world at times. This is a time for us to celebrate. But in our celebrations, we have to ask ourselves a question. And the question is always, how will we respond? Because as you've, as you've heard me say many times before, faith is responsive. So the question for us now is how will we bring Hosanna to the unbelieving world in which we live? To those still living in darkness who haven't yet heard the truth. To help them realise that the path to salvation and freedom is possible. And in saying that, I know a lot of people say there are many ways to God. I don't believe that to be true. I believe there's one way and one way only. And that is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Because Jesus is Lord in this place, is Lord of our lives. And only through coming to the Master will you receive salvation. So if you are tuning in, maybe for the first time, maybe... You've been a little bit disillusioned, been, been bewildered by the events of these last 12 months. Um, looking for answers, looking for meanings, um, meaning of life maybe. What is it all about? Then, in the words of one of my favourite modern day rappers, um, if you don't remember anything else, then remember this. Because uh, he says this, Jesus loves you, hallelujah, and he will never leave us. And that is the truth. So grace and peace to you all. Amen.